We're going to be looking at the story of Cain and Abel uh, tonight. We've done the, uh, the creation week, Genesis 1. We've done Adam and Eve. And now we want to look at Cain and Abel and see what we can uh, learn from that. Now, I'm going to read a verse from the New Testament uh, to begin with. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, if you'd like to turn to that. Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now that last phrase is quite remarkable. What he says, he being dead, yet speaketh. In other words, what it was that Abel did speaks to us down the ages. Uh, and Abel, as you know, was one generation from Adam. And he's still speaking by the thing that he did. He's still speaking to us today. So the, uh, it's well worth uh, reading about him again and thinking, what was it that he did? that is so important and that speaks to us today. So if we turn uh, to Genesis uh, chapter 4, please. The setting here is that the Adam and Eve have been expelled from the Garden of Eden. It says, uh, the last verse of chapter 3 says, So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the tree of life. So we'll read at verse 1 of chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, thou shalt, not, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the earth, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now we'll just... Uh, We'll read it in verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the west of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. 
And unto Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as of cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Namath. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged seventyfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. May God add a blessing uh, to the reading of his word. Thank you for following. I just read the most of the chapter there. <clears throat> it's most refreshing to be able to read the true early history of man. If you, if you take any scientific textbook or school textbook and read about the, the rise of civilizations and uh, animal husbandry and metalwork and musical instruments and music, you'll get, you, you'll, they'll tell you these things took millions, uh, millions and millions of years to evolve. Well, here we have the true historical account. And it's worth repeating, I have absolutely no problem in taking the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Literally, I believe we're all descended from Adam and Eve, everyone in this room, and there is no one on the earth who is not descended from Adam and Eve. I have no problem with a six-day creation, and I have no problem now in reading the history of Cain and Abel. But we, we're in a situation now at the opening of chapter 4 that Adam and Eve have now got two sons, Cain and Abel. And I wonder what account they give to their two boys of how they came to be expelled from the Garden of Eden. From that position of a wonderful blessing and privilege and fellowship when God would have come down in the cool of the evening and walked with them and talked with them and they could eat of all the trees of the garden except for the one there was a boundary put on their uh, behavior uh, and there was only one tree that they were told, commanded not to eat of. And yet they, they did it and the moment they did it, they died to God. And the moment they did it, they were lost to God and alienated to God. So it was, uh, it was a sad, catastrophic moment in the life uh, of Adam especially, who was responsible, although Eve gave him the fruit, he, should have, he shouldn't have taken it. And the sin and death came into the world. And now they were outside the garden and they had two boys, so I do not know what did they, did they describe to them, what conditions were once like uh, in the garden, and to describe the trees and the flowers and the animals, and how Adam had named the animals, and did they describe those wonderful conditions on earth. And I, I wonder how they explained why they had taken that fruit in defiance of God's command. And I think if Cain and Abel had have asked their parents, 
Why, why did you take it when you knew it would bring death? What, what would they have said? You know what I think they would have said? I think they would have said nothing. They were absolutely guilty. They had no excuse, whatever. And now they were out. But the question now arose. This is the important question. If, if they're now sinners and outside the Garden of Eden and alienated and lost to God, was there any way in which a sinner could approach God and be accepted by him? Now that is, that is the most important question even today. Is there a way in which a person who has sinned, a sinner by nature and practice, is there a method, a means of approach to God by which God will accept him? So there was, we're going to find out now, it sounds a bit like a gospel meeting for a, for a while, but it, there is a right way and the wrong way to approach God. And the whole world resembles these two men. They all resemble either Abel or they resemble Cain. The world is divided into those two groups on the way they approached God. Now, Cain was no atheist. He wasn't an atheist. He's, he's, he's bringing an offering to God, to the Lord. So he's not an atheist. He's, but we'll, we'll see now. It says Adam knew his wife conceived. And uh, it says that in verse 2, <clears throat> she again bare his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So there were two honourable occupations. I, I wouldn't try to read too much into that or spiritualise on that. But one was a keeper of sheep, one was a tiller of the ground. Now it says in verse 3, in process of time. So I would say these are the years of maturity and they knew what they were doing and they wanted in, uh, to approach God. In process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So he gathered up the fruit, the vegetables, and I suppose in that first generation world, that very young earth, as it were, the vegetables and the fruit must have been tremendous. It must have been some harvest uh, offering that Cain meant, but it was just a harvest offering. It was plants and vegetables. Abel, it says, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord, it says, the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. So what made the difference? Now, as Abel, we'll deal with Abel first. Abel brought firstlings of the flock. It's plural. And these are uh, uh, the, the first lamb to be born to a sheep. You know, the firstlings of the flock, the best of the flock. And he, he brought them and as he, as he would have taken a lamb, he would have slain the lamb, his blood would have been poured out, and the lamb would have been offered on the altar. Now you might say, well, what on earth did that mean? And why did that have to be done? Well, it's as if Abel was looking at that lamb, and just to put words into Abel's mouth, Abel it's as if Abel was saying to God, I'm the death-deserving one. I'm the one who deserves to die. But this innocent victim has died in my place. And there is his blood poured out. Now we sang, we sang about the cross, or at least we listened to a, a song 
about the cross at the beginning. I was glad we, we played at him the old rugged cross. And the one who died there, isn't that exactly what happened at the cross? And when a person gets saved, they may not articulate these words exactly, but this is the ground of their reproach. They're approaching God and they're saying, I'm the one, I'm the sinner, the condemned sinner who deserves to die. But this innocent victim has died in my place. The one dying on the cross took your place and mine. And that, is, that was the lesson that of Abel's sacrifice, it was showing that God accepted someone when they came to him as a sinner and on the ground of shed blood. That there was a sacrifice that had been offered by him. And for us, a great sacrifice has been offered. And Jesus Christ offered himself a sacrifice for sin once and for all. And Abel was accepted. God accepted what he had done. He had come to him on the ground of shed blood. Now, when you go on through your Bible and read about the, the law of Moses, it's good to remember the law of Moses taught three things. Firstly, the law of Moses taught men something about God. It taught them something about men. And it taught them something about our approach to God. It taught them something. The law of Moses taught men that God was absolutely holy and absolutely righteous. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And so on and so on. Absolutely righteous and absolutely holy. So the, the Hebrew under the law of Moses had no doubt that the God of heaven and earth and the God of Israel was absolutely righteous and absolutely holy. He knew that. The law taught him that about God. But then it also taught him, it taught man something about himself. It taught man that he was a sinner. Because when he tried to keep the law, he discovered he couldn't keep the law. He could, uh, he could uh, appreciate what it was commanding him to do, but he didn't have the power to do it. And so uh, if the law said, be ye perfect, as God is perfect, he couldn't be perfect. And you might say, well, it just taught man that he was a sinner and that the law condemned him. So it teaches that there is a holy and righteous God and it teaches that man is a sinner who cannot keep the law, cannot rise to God's standard, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what was the third thing then that the law taught? The law taught that it was possible for a sinner to approach God on the ground of shed blood and the whole sacrificial system at the tabernacle and then in the temple there were sin offerings and trespass offerings and burnt offerings and so on and there were priests to do it on the behalf of the people and so Israel knew that there was only one way to approach a holy God it was by sacrifice and when the person did that and approached God on the ground of shed blood, God accepted him. So the law taught that. And when you go on through from your Old Testament to your New Testament, in John chapter 1 you read those wonderful words, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so we discover that all the sacrifices of the law 
in themselves didn't remove sin. They couldn't. But they were all pointers. They were all little pictures of something that Christ would do, the Son of God would do, when he would come into the world. And so the Lord Jesus has provided the way back to God. He has provided the way that you and I could approach God. We did it uh, at the moment we were saved. We were coming by God's way, by his providing. He has provided a sacrifice for sins for us. Christ died for us. So it's wonderful that we have been accepted just as Abel was accepted because his offering spoke of Christ's death on the cross. We can look back. We live 2,000 years after Calvary and the gospel is the proclamation of what Christ did on the cross. It's a finished work and we can tell the whole world in the gospel that there's salvation and forgiveness because Christ died for the ungodly. Now, so much so, let's now think of Cain. And how did Cain approach God? Now, Cain, as we said, he wasn't an atheist. He seemed to be typical of the person. He wanted to be right with God. He wanted to be right with God on his terms. And Abel, Abel's sacrifice was an acknowledgement that actually Abel himself was death deserving. But Cain wasn't making any admission like that. Cain wasn't coming to God and saying, I'm a sinner who deserves death. He was coming and he was offering a sacrifice of the work of his hands. There was no blood, there was no life given, there was no blood shed. And it's if Cain was saying, I'm, I'm coming to you uh, on the, the basis of my work. And this is out of the ground and out of the work and I planted it and I've, I've grown it, I've tended it, I've harvested it and here I'm bringing, uh, I'm bringing this to you. Now it says that the uh, unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And there are many people in the world, aren't there? And they are coming to God on the ground of their own work. Cain might have given God thanks for his food. I don't know if he did. But he would stop short at this. He wouldn't say to God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Abel had got that message. He had learnt that. That he needed God's mercy and he needed to come on the ground of shed blood. Cain hadn't got that message. And I don't believe Cain, when we read, Cain was rather cheeky almost when, when we read some of the things he says later. But he came and he was not acknowledging that he was a sinner and he would not acknowledge that someone would need to give their life for him. So we can be glad we're saved and we've come to an appreciation that Christ died for us. Now, Cain, what was Cain's reaction? Well, he was angry and he was full of envy. And we get the first case of religious persecution in history. It says Cain was very wroth, very wroth, and his countenance fell. So suddenly his face changed and he didn't like what was happening. And what rose up in his heart was not repentance and saying, I will come the way Abel came. But instead his reaction was to hate his brother. To hate his brother. And we're going to see that he actually murdered him. So six, 
Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? In other words, he could come the same way as Abel came. But he isn't, he isn't attempting it. If thou doest well, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And there was a warning there. If you reject God's way to come, sin will become your master. Sin will condemn you. You'll just go worse uh, further and further into sin. And so we read there was the Lord was pleading to my mind with Cain in these verses that if you do well, if you do well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you don't do well, sin lies at the door. Cain, you can come the same way as Abel came. It was good we all came to Christ the way Abel came. It was not just to acknowledge I'm a guilty sinner, but Jesus died for me. Now it says Cain talked with Abel, his brother. That, that sends a kind of a chill down in my spine as I read that because uh, he was talking with him, but he was plotting his murder. He hated him. It's an awful thing. Human hatred is an awful thing. And we're seeing a, an example of it here. And when they were in the field, uh, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So you have the first murder in history, and it's a man murdering his own brother. And he's murdering him because his own deeds were evil and Abel's deeds were righteous. And that's the start of religious persecution. Why, why, do, why do Afghans hate Christians? Why do Chinese communists hate Christians? Why do, they, do you know why? Because their own deeds are evil and they can see the Christians' deeds are righteous. And the most innocent and best of men have suffered the most appalling imprisonments and tortures and deaths from wicked men, especially in, in communist countries uh, in, in the, the last couple of lifetimes. So nothing has changed. And people, the ungodly man, will hate the righteous man because he exposes his own evil. Now the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Now listen to the lies. He said, I know not. Of course he knew. He had murdered him. He knew exactly where he had left the body. Am I my brother's keeper? He's actually being cheeky to the Lord. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, This is sad. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. So every deed ever done from Cain and Abel to now, God knows. And there is a record in, of every nation, in every age, of every person. You know, at the great white throne, when all the dead will stand before that great white throne, it says, that's the unbelieving dead, the books were opened, and men were judged out of the books according to the works. Everything, everyone has done, is recorded. Now, of course, there are, there's a great exception, and that's the believer, because Christ died on the cross for us that we might never be judged and charged for our sins, that we might be forgiven. So that is, that is wonderful. But uh, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. There is no 
hint, whatever, of repentance in Cain's response. Uh, he's just trying to get off with a lighter sentence, as it were. And uh, the Lord, uh, marked, uh, in verse 15, the second part, the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, it says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. One of the saddest, that's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. And that's one of the saddest things a person could do in life, to go out from the presence of the Lord. In other words, to be a Christ rejecter and to leave it and to say, I don't want it. That is the worst choice a man can make in life. Well, Cain, he, he dwelt in the east of Eden. He knew his wife, who at that time, in those early generations, uh, uh, would have been uh, his sister, I, I would imagine. Uh, but there would have been no genetic issues uh, in those early days uh, with uh, inter-family or anything like that. And she conceived and bore Enoch and built it a city. So notice how Cain is, what Cain is doing, he's built a city. And a city is for security and activity. And notice a Lamech, uh, one of his descendants, took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Now notice what you have here in verses 20 in these coming verses. You have the beginning of all animal husbandry. Verse 20 says, Jabel, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. So you have animal husbandry, the beginning there. Verse 21, Jubal was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ. So now you have man, they become musical, and this is the, the, the intellectual side of life and the arts. Not that there's anything wrong with this, but they were doing these things in estrangement to God and leaving God out. And then Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So you had the beginning of metalwork, the beginning of industry. So you had a, um, a, a city without God and a world without God. Cain's civilization was without God. But at the end of the chapter, there's a note of hope because to replace Abel, and the Lord Jesus referred to Abel as a righteous man. To write the blood, he referred to the blood of righteous Abel, which means the Lord considered Abel to be a historical person, not some kind of mytho person as some even some Christians would want you to believe. But it says to Seth, uh, to him also there was born a son. So the, re the replacement for Abel was Seth. And the last phrase of uh, verse 26, then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. So there's the beginning of prayer. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So that, at the end of this sad chapter, you get there is hope. And we know that the line of Seth, the Lord Jesus was of the line of Seth, and he came in. And he gave himself a sacrifice for sins on Calvary's cross so that we could approach God and be accepted of him. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And what Abel did right there in one generation from Adam, God put it on record how a sinner can approach God and be accepted. It's good to be saved. And you and I have come on the ground 
of the precious shed blood of Christ. Now, I just finished by reading one little verse uh, from 1 John chapter 3, and then I'm, I'm, I'm sitting down. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, I'll read it at verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that ye should love one another. This is so important. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. So it's very important that we love our brethren, our brothers, and our sisters. And we've been considering Abel, Cain and Abel. And Abel, even though he's dead, he's still speaking. So may God bless our meditation on this lovely chapter. Thank you.